My name is David Meyer, and, and I'm going to be talking about seeing voice, uh, visualizing the vocal tract using MRI. And I first need to acknowledge my co-conspirators and co-authors on this paper, David Howard from Royal Holloway uh, University of London, and Sajan uh, Lingala from the University of Iowa. Sajan couldn't join us today. He should be here next year. Um, but what you're stuck with today is the two Davids. So David Howard should be in the room also. So when I was planning this talk, I had a few titles in mind, and I was dissuaded by people I care about not to use them. But the first one was what I did on sabbatical or on vacation, and I was busier than normal, so I didn't feel like a vacation. And the other was an autopsy of the voice, and if Ron Bacon were here, he would be probably nodding his head, because as you know, autopsy in Greek means to see with one's own eyes, and I'm talking about seeing voice. So why should we care about this? Singing voice pedagogy is moving more and more towards a fact-based framework, um, and to it might not be moving as fast as some of us may like, but that's the direction it's certainly going. And this requires knowledge of the instrument's structure and function. And vocal track models may have profound implications for voice pedagogy, especially vocal track models that are based on reality and 3D images. So singers are unique. Uh, we are unusual and unique in that we play an instrument that we never see. It's hidden, and it's biological, it's living, and that's wonderful, it's very portable, but it, it, has, it has a downside that is biological. We never see it, and we rely on secondary feedback for knowledge of results. We rely on proprioception, we rely on oral feedback to know whether we're doing our job correctly. And so my question today is, would it change things if you could see it? I posed this question to my dean when I was asking him for money. He's a violist and a very accomplished violist. He's played viola over 30 years on international stages. And I said to him, what happens after 30 years of living your life with viola and playing viola and being concerned with viola all your working day? What happens after 30 years if I showed you what a viola looked like? Would that change things? And that's the question I posed for you all today. So for this, study, we have a two-part feasibility study. We developed two MR protocols that we wanted to test, and then we wanted to take data from the second of those two and convert it to CAD files for 3D printing. And I'm happy to share the slides and, and other information after this talk, so I'm going quickly because there's too many slides and with too many words. So we had a participant, um, one whose voice I'm very familiar with, um, get scans in October and also earlier this month um, at the University of Iowa. That's me. I don't know if you can recognize my chin. And the, these are two of the three coils we tested out. But we tested out three commercially available coils to see how they would do for vocal tract imaging. Um, and this is, this is me if the top of my head were chopped off. Um, the scans were conducted on a GE3T scanner uh, equipped with high performance gradients at the University of Iowa Hospital in Phoenix, Hawks. And we tested out three different coil arrays, a 32-channel head array, a 16-channel head and neck coil, and a 16-channel flex coil to evaluate the acceleration capabilities and the different commercial of these different commercial coils. So can we take commercially available coils and get high quality vocal tract imaging was the main question. And if Sajan were here, he could go into greater detail about how we accomplished this, but it was remarkable. The spatial resolution for the dynamic, for the dynamic protocol was two and a half millimeters squared, and he achieved about six milliseconds per frame after uh, constrained reconstruction, which is, to me, remarkable. And yeah, so I'll show you all of this. If you have questions about this, come and see me, and I'll share you the slides. And then the second protocol was to look at 3D vowel um, images of the whole vocal tract. And we did these tasks in, for the dynamic task. The dynamic protocol was taking a mid-sagittal view in 2D, but in real time. And I said the rainbow passage because I think one should. That's what we do. <laughs> and then I sang some octave arpeggi. Uh, and then I sang Der Lindenbaum, one of my favorite songs by Schubert, 
uh, and doing this in the tube was an experience. So, and then for the for the vowels, I sang four vowels times 15 seconds each, and then we captured another four earlier this month. So we have we have really lovely, beautiful images of eight different vocal track shapes on eight different vowels. And then to evaluate the coils, we looked at the image quality, the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and we assessed them for blurring between the air and tissue interfaces. And then, the lastly, we took these 3D data from the second protocol to Royal Holloway and David Howard and, and Alex here at one of the lab techs uh, worked on putting them into CAD and then printing them. This is really cool. That's, I'm sorry, this is just something I've been thinking about for years. And you can have these. So the CAD files will be freely shared under the Creative Commons license on the NATS website. And if you don't know what Creative Commons is, here's Wikipedia. It means you can use them, credit us, we won't sue you, okay. Um, so results, the head and neck coil of the three coils produced really beautiful images. Um, they it produce images with good sensitivity and minimal G-factor losses compared to the head-only coil and the flex coils. Um, the 2D dynamic sequences they captured robust characterizations of the vocal tract dynamics with, not, with really minimal blurring of those t air tissue interfaces. And, um, and this protocol that, that Sajan has developed can be used for other speech tasks as well with improved imaging speed. And here is, here is an example of the rainbow passage. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, round arch with the path high above and two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Mm -hmm. There is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold. <laughs> capturing the audio from these images in October and failed, but then with some upgrades to the system, we were able to get this audio. And as you, any of you know who have been in a scanner, um, it's terribly loud in there. So to capture the audio, and it's not great audio, and, and the vein singer in me is not pleased with some of the singing sounds, but to capture the audio that well is, is pretty, pretty all right. I'm going to skip that one because I didn't want to. I like watching my beam up dance. And then lastly, a, a Schubert excerpt done too quickly because I kept running out. The scanning window was so short, I wanted to sing this Schubert beautifully and I kept getting chopped off. So here's, here's short Schubert. Yeah, and I just like the way the drilled R looks, so I, I, I elongated that a bit. All right. No. So for the for the 3D vowel images, uh, we we got some wonderful pictures. This is an A, ah, as you can see on the left, uh, an E and an U, with really surprisingly good resolution. Singing this for 15 seconds, and uh, if anyone has ever wanted to see my glottis, there it is. Um, this is averaged over 15 seconds, but still. And then these DICOM files were con uh, converted to CAD files and taken to Royal Holloway, where David Howard printed them. And you should catch his vocal tract organ talk later this week. And a very, very short demo. So my duck call is standing in. These fit onto a speaker driver, um, but this is, this is easier. So Sten was talking about this looking like a cobra. Yesterday, was it? Do I remember mm -hmm. correctly? So.